Welcome to Connect Your Career Pathway with Planet's Destiny, a webinar for graduate students and postdoctoral researchers. I'm, I'm Jörg Schlutter. I'm the moderator of today, and I'm joining you from Washington, D.C. in the U.S., where I'm in my daytime job. I'm leading the ACS Office of Research Grants. I shared with you where I'm joining from and who I am. Please feel free to use the chat function to share with everyone in the audience who you are, what your role is, and from which city you're joining today's Zoom call. As we wait for the chat entries, let me share with you also that today I have the privilege to share with you briefly some thoughts on career and professional development. And I guess I have the privilege because over the last 14 plus years, I have developed and implemented career and professional development programming at universities, nonprofit organizations, and for the government. Beyond the career and professional development section, I will also touch briefly on UN sustainable development goals, and I will be a hero and wrap it up after 10 minutes because then we will segue in the most important portion of today's webinar where we listen to career stories from our wonderful panelists. We have today two professionals from the United States and two professionals joining us from Germany, followed by the Q&A. And then we're not done yet because we have a little webinar quiz for you where you could win a certificate. At the very end of the quiz, you will have the ability to participate in a challenge. And my dear colleague, Dr. Karen Ferber, will share with you at the end of this webinar what this challenge is about. So I will keep it very brief at this point. Throughout the session, feel free to type in your questions for the speakers in the chat and to everyone who has already submitted their questions prior to the webinar. Thank you. Also a big thank you to the planning committee, Dr. Karin Ferber from the Chemical Abstract Services and Dr. Hans-Georg Meinig from the German Chemical Society. Also a big thank you to Helena Kebele and Justin Yu from the logistics supports team from ACS. And now, career and professional development. And the one thing which I would like to focus on, wrapping my 14 plus years of experience into one thing, one take home message is develop your career story. And if you think about a career story, you might think first possibly about how speakers are introduced at a GDCH conference or an ACS conference. For example, Dr. Jörg Schlatter received his PhD from the University of Heidelberg and he did a lot of RNA research focusing on the generation of ribozymes and aptamers, focusing on structure determination, blah, blah, blah. And he worked at institutions in the United States and Germany. He moved into science management and he works now as a director uh, at the ACS Office of Research Grants. So this is, in my opinion, not really a convincing and nice career story. And I don't want that you think about just listing some roles you had and would like to approach over time on a sheet of paper. I would like to think about a good story and what those good stories include. There is a premise. You set up different locations, characters, and circumstances. You describe them. You develop a plot, a sequence of events. All events are somewhat connected to each other and developing a deeper understanding how that all fits and how you develop your story. And most importantly, there's a theme associated with the story, a purpose. One way how you should think about developing your career story is possibly outlining a table of content that describes your career and life story. In my case, I would start with an introduction. I will talk about my family because they had a huge impact on who I am right now and what I'm doing right now. I grew up in Schwaben in Berlin. Uh, I had educational experiences, not only in chemistry, and I felt music, my musical experience was super important for me to get me there where I'm right now. My book, My Career Story, would include a chapter on cultural adaptation, competence development, STEM research, science management. And I think looking at this outline of the story, I'm already a little bit more excited than the thing what you saw earlier. But again, this is not about my career story. It's really about your career story. 
your career, which is so closely tied with your life, your story, which is unique, and your story that will come with surprises, your story that will come with tough decisions. And ultimately, you will reflect many years from now, it is a super rewarding and satisfying career and life and story that you have developed. The good thing is there's one thing in place that you could use to develop your career story. And that thing we call the individual development plan process. What is it? And con it consists of four parts. Self-assessment. Who are you? What are your values? What are your strengths? What are your wants? What are your needs? This is a very tough portion to look really deep inside you and determining who you truly are and who you want to become. Exploration is the second portion of the individual development plan process. What options do you have? And as chemists, we are uniquely qualified to engage fully in that portion. We are explorers. We are curious. And Explore which options you have in academia, at universities, in industry, in government, and non at nonprofit organization. Explore if you would like to start your own startup company, for example. But don't stop just there. Learn about the different roles that are available in those four or five sectors. Learn about the different cultures, because a role in one organization will be different from the role in a, in a different organization because the cultures are different. Be an explorer. Now, think about how you will make actually your decisions with whom you would have to consult to make the best positions possible right now at this time. As you make your decisions, set up specific goals that explain how you envision to get there. Do me also one favor. As you go through this process, write it down on a piece of paper because then you have your plan in place, an individual development plan play, uh, individual development plan. You could also use, of course, individual development plans that are freely available online, for example, ACS's Chem IDP. I will check later the link to Chem IDP. As you develop this IDP for yourself, keep in mind, don't do it just once. Go through this process maybe once, twice a year. Be aware that only you are the owner of your career. No one else, not your faculty advisor, not your family, not your spouse. You are in charge of your career and you have to make those decisions. Of course, you could consult with a lot of people who you trust. You must consult with them. For example, other GDC members, ACS members who have a little bit more experience and ask possibly you the right questions so you could develop the best career for yourself. Recognize unforeseen opportunities and define your career vision. At this point, a lot of students and postdocs ask me, what is a career vision? And let me be very clear, there is a difference between career vision and career goals. Career visions help imagine chapters of your ideal career, chapters of your career story. Career visions give you a sense of purpose. Career visions are broad. In contrast, career goals are distinct steps and chapters that lead towards your career vision, to your, towards your career dream. Let me give you an example. An example of a career vision is providing clean water to all people. It's very broad and you could immediately imagine you could really serve in many different roles to really work towards their, that career vision. Examples of associated career goals are Develop novel and cheap water filtration systems during my doctoral thesis by 2028. Or join a small business that produces novel clean water and sanitation systems as product development leader by 2029. Those are just two examples. At this point, I can imagine some of you think, hmm, how do I define, how do I find, how do I find really a good career vision? The good thing is the world needs you. The planet needs you to solve the big problems. In 2015, the UN created a universal call to action to end poverty, protect the planet, and ensure that all people enjoy peace and prosperity by 2030. Those 17 goals, the SDG, Sustainable Development Goals, range from no poverty, quality education, to affordable and clean energy, to reduced inequalities, responsible consumption and production, up to life on earth, uh, life on land. 
any of those 17 could serve as a starting point to craft your unique career vision. ACS and other chemical societies has have identified at least seven of those SDGs as goals, UN Sustainable Development Goals, where chemists could have a true and unique impact. Zero hunger, good health and well-being, clean water and sanitation, affordable and clean energy, industry innovation and infrastructure, responsible consumption and production, climate action. Now, for you, the question is, could any of those SDGs serve as a framework for your personal career vision that enables you to write your unique career story? This question will not be answered today, but we will give you more inspiration today. We will listen now to career stories from our four wonderful panelists, Dr. Stephanie Wieck from the Umweltbundesamt in Germany, Dr. Adelina wojcikowa kostal from the American Chemical Society, Dr. Emil Dobolar, who is with Freudenberg Technology, and Dr. Sanjaya Senanyake, who works at the Brookhaven National Laboratory. Every panelist will have about seven minutes to share their unique career stories and convey how they work under the sustain sustainability umbrella. And with that said, I will keep my introductions of every single panelist very brief because they will share, share more about themselves in their little story. Let's start with Dr. Stephanie Wieck, who works at the Federal Environment Agency. Stephanie, I will turn it over to you. Yes, uh, thank you very much uh, for this introduction, which was also very interesting for me. I wish I had known this when I started uh, my career development. <laughs> but um, anyway, I'm going to talk about um, how I did it and um, what steps I took uh, to get where I am at the moment. Um, and um, I, well, I think it it all started somehow with a presentation I gave at school on sewage treatment plants, which um, fascinated me a lot. Um, so I, I, I was really interested in wastewater at that time. So uh, when I finished school, uh, I didn't want to do something too theoretical. So I, I started studying at a University of Applied Science, not at a, um, yeah, no, normal university. Um, uh, at the beginning, I thought I, I wanted to study chemical engineering because I had done an internship at our local garbage company. And the colleague I was working together with, with was a chemical engineer. But um, I then looked up the different study plans and found out no environmental engineering is rather what I wanted to do. So I started, started studying this um, at the University of Applied Science in Lübeck in northern Germany. And um, during my studies, um, which took four years, I moved my focus a little bit from water management rather to environmental chemistry because that fascinated me even more. Um, and in the end, I wrote my final thesis at Greenpeace uh, on pesticide drift and uh, pesticides in the gardens of people living close to orchards. So um, after this, I, I finished my studies um, in 2008 and um, I thought I would work a little bit more for Greenpeace, but uh, this didn't work out at that time. Um, and luckily, um, I'm always for safety nets. So um, during writing my thesis, I applied at the German Environment Agency just for safety to, to have a backup. And um, I was lucky to have this backup so, um, and got the job. Um, and so I started working there in January uh, 2009, thinking that I would quickly search for something else because I thought that working at an agency would be very boring. Um, and I was sure that I wanted to do my PhD later on. So um, I thought, okay, I'll try this and then search for a PhD position somewhere else. However, um, I must say, and I'm, um, it turned out that working there is a lot of fun and very interesting. And my um, employee didn't make me say that, but um, I really think that is a um, very interesting position. And uh, the agency itself offered so many opportunities to develop my skills further while working there that there was no necessity to, to change um, the employee. 
So um, I started working at the biocide section, who, uh, which is the section that um, is responsible for the environmental risk assessment of biocide products. Um, and uh, since that, I, I did a master in a long distance postgraduate program in environment and education. I did my postgraduate as an ecotoxicologist, and um, I also did my PhD on biocides in wastewater um, funded by the German Environment Foundation. So that I was uh, able to, with this funding, I was able to put together the topic I was most interested on for my PhD, um, which was a combination of my work at that time, biocides and wastewater, because I like wastewater. <laughs> Um, and I've been continuing working at the biocide section ever since, um, to some extent, but also worked for more than two years with a 50% position at International Chemicals Management. Some of you maybe heard of the ICCM5 um, that took place this September on International Chemicals Ma Management on UN level. So I worked in this area and um, since the beginning of this year, I work for 50% at our president's office um, where I'm um, working in the team that is responsible for the international relations, um, focusing on EU legislation. And our job there is to bring together our expert we have at the Environment Agency, which are around one. 1,700 people working on all kinds of topics um, of environment and climate um, with the policymakers of uh, EU environmental policy um, to feed our scientific experiences and our knowledge uh, into the lawmaking process. And um, at, some, at some time in my life, uh, I noticed that everything I did since school had the name environment in it. When I write my CV, it's quite boring because it always says uh, Umwelt, 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 um, except for Greenpeace, but that doesn't count because it's at least green. Um, and I would say that the vision I had for my career since the early beginning was uh, reducing the footprint that mankind is having on the environment. So uh, thinking of, of my decisions, I could have never imagined having a position that would not contribute to this goal. And I mean, of course, I was very lucky to find a position that is perfectly in line with this so quickly. So I never had to make a choice not earning money or um, not doing something else. Um, so um, yeah, I was I was lucky, I have to say. Um, and as environment and health is so closely interlinked, um, you hopefully have heard of the buzzword One Health already, which is very important of um, focusing of the interlinkages of environment and health topics. Um, it's hard to say which SDG my career is connected to because those are interlinked as well very closely. And I would say that chemists also can work on um, life on land and on sea um, by developing chemicals that don't affect uh, this life. Um, but if I would be pressed to decide, uh, I would say that SDG 12 was most relevant because it contains a target on the sound management of chemicals, um, which is um, also part of the work I'm, I'm doing uh, at Uber. Um, and we didn't reach this goal, unfortunately, until 2020 as planned, but we're trying very hard to progress and um, I'll try my best to continue this work uh, in the future. And uh, yeah, that was what uh, kept me going uh, in the last uh, 14 years, almost 15. And um, yeah, that's it from my side. Thank you so much, Stephanie. Uh, what a wonderful story, very inspirational and something which is so important to really know or be aware that everything is just connected with each other, right? So even the SDGs, there's not one SDG which could be tackled alone. There's always a connection. Our careers are connected with different experiences, etc. Anyway, I can't wait to our Q&A session, but let's move on to our next speaker. The next speaker is Dr. Adelina vajkova Costal, who serves as the Director of the Office of Sustainability here at ACS. Adelina. Thank you so much, Bjork. So I'm going to try to, to maintain your level of energy because it's, it's inspirational. Um, and uh, this is a 
a great story you just heard. So um, I'm uh, currently serving as, as director for sustainable development, as, as York said, and um, I'd love to, to share a little bit more about how I've, I've gotten here and, and uh, what I hope to be able to accomplish. So I'm just going to share my screen with you. Great. So York, I'm not sure if this will meet the high definition that <laughs> <laughs> you put up for an inspirational story, but but I'm going to give it a try. Um, so I'm actually originally from Jamaica. Uh, I grew up there and I uh, got interested in, in some environmental work in high school. Um, and so this is this is not me. This is a colleague of mine, but I couldn't find a picture of me <laughs> here. But we are um, at a, a site of a bauxite mine there. Jamaica has a lot of bauxite. And so um, we're here in the, the red mud pond, which is where the waste or um, gets dumped and we're sampling the ore um, to figure out how much heavy metal contamination there is and what that means for the community. So I, I did that for a few summers and I thought this is really impactful because you, you can you know, really connect what you love to do, which is what the time was with science, um, to people's lives. And so I, I think um, that really had an impact on me when you know, you go and talk to the communities and, and see um, what their challenges are and how it's affected by the, the level of heavy metals. So I moved on to my undergraduate career. I um, received a, a scholarship from Jamaica um, to do my bachelor's degree in the US. Um, and I ended up in a small, very cold town in Vermont, which is very north part of the US, um, just uh, south of the Canadian border in Middlebury. It's very tiny, but it, it was a fantastic um, education and I was able to get my uh, bachelor's degree in chemistry. And I got to do some fun research uh, with a, a professor who was working at the time on platinum anti-cancer drugs. And so that's where I, I really you know, found a love for organometallic chemistry, which is you know, just such a, a fascinating way of thinking about how metals and organics can interact and what they can do once they get together and, and start to uh, to, to be able to uh, have certain properties and functions uh, and the applications to medicine, I thought was was really fascinating and it was underexplored compared to other applications. So I figured, well, I should probably go to graduate school since I wanted to do more research. Um, and uh, I, I applied um, in the US, I actually applied to, to Spain as well. I, I also love Europe. I'm originally, um, I was born in Europe and I thought, you know, that was an option as well, but I found a great a graduate program um, at Yale, and I uh, did my bachelor's, uh, my, I'm sorry, my PhD uh, work there with uh, a well-known organometallic chemist, Bob Crabtree, who was a, a very uh, interesting uh, British professor who had landed in the U.S. also uh, some years before. And uh, so the, the one thing that I really appreciated is that he really gave his students a lot of freedom to explore and to try out ideas and so I, I learned a lot of organometallic chemistry from him, but one of the biggest lessons I think I learned was to trust my gut and um, that it's okay to try things if they fail. So I uh, did some work with him in homogeneous catalysis, um, a lot of and heterocyclic carbene chemistry, if you're at all familiar with this field, um, rhodium and palladium, a lot of beautiful precious metals um, that we now know are, are slightly slightly problematic. Uh, but you know that I got a great experience from this, but the one thing that I, I couldn't quite get a handle on is how you can connect that to actual impact. And so that year um, that I was just about to graduate, uh, we had a, a visiting lecturer at, at my um, uh, department at Yale and, and the lecturer was Paul Anastas. So picture here on the bottom left. Um, and Paul Anastas was um, at the time at the EPA um, and he had started a new green chemistry institute um, that uh, you know had really tried to, to make a difference in how chemists think about environmental impact of chemistry and so that was probably my aha moment in trying to connect what I loved which was you know trying to connect science and people and um, the the fundamental part of organometallic chemistry that I did my PhD in. And so um, I you know, decided to, to go ahead and, and um, take a postdoc with him. Um, I, I applied and he, it was obvious that um, he was just um, getting his lab started and, and he um, needed some people. So I, I was just proactive. I just you know, 
went to his office and I was, uh, I remember a little bit scared because he was a very famous um, and, and renowned scientist who was just coming to Yale to start his uh, new lab out of the, the EPA. But um, he gave me a chance, but he said, you know, I don't want you to work on organic metallic chemistry. I want to think about how chemists can understand the hazard of chemicals in a way that that resonates with what they know about nucleophiles and electrophiles and how they interact. And I looked at him and I thought, oh, this is not going to go well at all because <laughs> I knew very little about toxicology. Um, but he said, you know, you can take a course, um, you can you can figure it out. And um, and so I I took a leap of faith. I abandoned organometallic chemistry for a couple of years. Um, and um, I'll, I'll give you a quick slide of what I, I did for my postdoc. So we had to figure out how to come up with these guidelines that you could tell a chemist, okay, if you have a chemical that has property X and property Y, it's going to be less hazardous or likely to be less hazardous. And um, we managed to do that. Um, so this is a, a graph showing that you know delta E, which is a homolumo gap for chemicals, it shows a broad uh, reactivity and the octanol water partition coefficient or distribution coefficient at a certain pH, which is how greasy versus um, a hydrophilic a molecule is, actually can tell you a lot about how likely it is to be toxic to fish. Um, and it, you know, it looks really simple now, but it, it took us, you know, quite a few years to get to the state from fundamental toxicology to developing something that is useful to average chemist who has never taken a toxicology course. So I'm going to go back here. Um, and so, you know, th this uh, then led me to a, an independent career. And I um, was lucky enough to get an appointment as an assistant professor at George Washington University. That's GWU right here. Uh, and I decided to, to set up my lab to work on catalysis for a circular economy. Um, and so the work that I did at, at George Washington tried to combine those two things. Um, and I'll just give you a brief preview of what that looked like, which is here. So if you're thinking about designing a new process, you need to think about, first of all, what are you making? What's the molecule? And that's how do you design that molecule to be useful in a commercial setting or um, for another application? So that's this design for function. But the next thing you have to think about is what's going to happen when it gets into the environment. And that's where my toxicology background I'd gotten really was helpful because I could think about how do I minimize the hazard of that chemical and its persistence. And then once I've done that, how do I develop the process that I need um, to be able to make that molecule. And so when you put all those three things together, <laughs> you can, yes, I'll be, I'll be done in one second. You can start to think about um, how to uh, develop a greener process overall. All right, so I'm gonna go back here and tell you that the irony of the situation is after um, GW a year ago, um, I was able to come to ACS um, and now work at the Green Chemistry Institute, um, where it, you know my one of my mentors, Paul Anastas, um, had uh, started um, initially. So you never know how your life is going to revolve, and hopefully, I'll be able to connect that back to my work in Jamaica. So um, thank you, York. Sorry, I went a couple of minutes over. No worries. Thank you so much for sharing a fascinating story. And let's move on to our next panelist, Dr. Emil Dobelar, who is a project manager at Freudenberg Technology. Emil, I will turn it over to you. Yes, thank you very much. Let me just briefly check how to start the screen sharing. And um, now I need to swap here. Yeah, uh, thank you very much. Um, also for the kind introduction and uh, yeah, the inspiring stories that we heard so far. I'm honored to be among this, these panelists. And I will also try to share a little bit my story, um, how I tried to uh, start sustainable chemistry through volunteer work and transfer that back to my professional life. So I was uh, very active in, uh, in German Chemical Society in the International Younger Chemist Network and also a little bit in the policy space in UNEP Major Group for Children and Youth. And then in the end, managed to transfer that to my professional life um, and get some learnings from there. So my story, I'm not going to start from scratch where I was born, <laughs> it would take too long. We only have seven minutes. My story for sustainable chemistry, if I need to pick one moment, starts probably in 2019. 
um, where I was at a Fridays for Future protest, I found myself um, asking for other people to make a change for our sustainable uh, future and then realized I just got a master's in chemistry. So maybe it is up to me to make that change. I have all the qualifications that it needs and I'm currently working on, on my PhD. Now, uh, the problem was I was already working on a topic that was not typically aligned with what you would consider green chemistry or sustainable chemistry was it just a, a metal organic topic. Um, and so I decided, okay, I can make a little bit of impact on that area, but not the scope that I want to. So I decided to uh, look around, where can I make an impact? And so uh, I was already active in the German Young Chemist Forum at GDCH, and uh, I was looking for an opportunity to contribute to sustainable chemistry outreach, at least. And I found that there was no such platform in the German Young Chemist Forum at that time. So I decided to change that, ran for the elections for board member of the German Young Chemist Forum, became a board member, and then in 2020 founded that sustainability team. Turns out a lot of other young chemists were thinking the same thing. We're looking for this type of opportunity. We got a good resonance and it is still running. They have amazing projects. So please check it out. Karen will post a link uh, later on. You can see some of our projects. So we started to do first sustainability outreach pro uh, projects. We did a survey in uh, collaboration with the International Younger Chemist Network to analyze how uh, sustainability in chemistry uh, is perceived by younger chemists and what the relevance is and what the current state is. And we published those results. Turns out there's a strong demand for more of that. There's not enough currently in the education system. So, um, and there's a lot of interesting works out there that you can read on this topic. Um, but it's up to us then uh, at this moment to to change that and to educate ourselves. Um, so I decided then when we were working on these nice international projects that I also wanted to expand my scope and turn towards the International Younger Chemist Network, where I became leader of the Public Outreach Committee and started driving forward initiatives again. Um, and also joined this, this policy space on the international um, platform uh, where we try to organize uh, or try to establish a chemicals and waste youth platform under the United Nations Environmental Program major group for children and youth. It's a whole mouthful, this <laughs> abbreviation. Um, and this is now also uh, finally established and they actually joined the International Conference on Chemicals uh, Management this year and was a good success. So it's nice to see that that also um, continues on. Um, so after working on these types of things for, for three years, I uh, wrote my first opinion piece in Pure and Applied Chemistry. Karen will also link that. There's another one in 2023 that uh, is a summary of this publication and another one that will hopefully come out next year. Uh, still working on that. And uh, through the IYCN, there's also another, I could list tons of initiatives, but if you take one away, the link will also be there from, from Karen, the global conversation on sustainability event, something that is not well established yet. We're trying to do that with IUPAC together, um, but we're here for career stories. So let me wrap it up here. I did a lot of things in my volunteer work because I could not do as much in my, uh, in my uh, PhD. I still did my PhD, but with this energy and with this proactiveness for sustainability, I applied for jobs and research because I wanted to also apply this to research more strongly. And this resonated a lot with uh, um, with Freudenberg and with, uh, with other companies that I applied for. Eventually I decided for Freudenberg because I decided I can make the biggest change there. And now I can work on, on these topics in research, like in sustainability and in the energy transition um, where I'm doing material development. Probably already very short on time, so I'll just quickly uh, point out a few things that I work on there. Um, nothing confidential, so I'm just here as a private person. It's not a Freudberg presentation, but what, uh, what Freudberg says is uh, we care about the carbon footprint and the handprint with our materials because Freudberg, um, you may know them, you may not, um, but they deliver a lot of parts, especially ceilings and lubrication um, materials and, and lubricants for um, for things that are relevant in the energy transition. This means wind turbines, this means uh, fuel cells and whatsoever. And it is important to consider what our material changes do to the final application. So you can have a more sustainable material. You're switching from something that has a poor carbon footprint in the material to one that has a better one, but maybe you're changing the frictional properties, which in the end skyrockets the uh, carbon footprint of, uh, of your application because you have so many energy losses. 
And what my take home message for you is uh, today is to say that sustainable material does not necessarily mean a sustainable product because we need to consider so many more things. There's a huge scope to consider as much more broad scope than a chemist can consider to make a product sustainable. A material can be sustainable, but the product needs to be sustainable. And this needs a lot of interdisciplinary uh, teams so that you consider everything. So take home message. Uh, one is sustainable solutions can only be achieved by working in interdisciplinary teams and by considering the whole value chain from start to the end of life. And this also includes the use phase of these lubricants, for example. Now, a few more key messages, if I may. Uh, from the first part of my topic, I want to tell you sustainable chemistry as a mindset is not limited to any research topic. I also uh, did consider the green chemistry principles in my uh, PhD to make at least my synthesis uh, for this topic that I was working on uh, as sustainable as they can can be. Uh, you don't have to be an expert on sustainable chemistry to be the champion of your community. So just get engaged, take up responsibility, lead by example and drive the meaningful initiatives for a better future that you can. Best, of course, in these types of professional networks where you can really bring the most assets towards. And don't let yourself be discouraged by disapproval of peers and do what your heart tells you. Circling back to my PhD, um, you all know it. If you're presenting at a conference, you get 12 minute slot. You decide what to pack in there. I decided to pack in a slide about the green chemistry principles of my, um, of my synthesis. My supervisor, however, told me, why are you wasting time on this? You could present more interesting academic results. So I decided this was more important for me. And I think it is important that more people do that to share this, to raise awareness, and also share interesting approaches for the community to use. And I still got my PhD. He was not mad about it that I included it because he said, it's your presentation, you do you. Um, but just, yeah, push for it. From the second part of my presentation, I want to uh, say uh, sustainability, if you're considering it truly means considering the whole value chain and the impact of the carbon footprint and what we at Freudenberg call the handprint. Um, that interdisciplinarity is the key to avoid overlooking critical aspects of sustainability. There's a lot of talk about greenwashing and companies doing greenwashing. Oftentimes, my feeling is that it is if there is greenwashing, it is unintentional because maybe some aspects were not considered. And if you calculate it in a different way, maybe it looks like greenwashing, even though if you calculate it in another way, then it looks more sustainable again. So just make sure from the scientific perspective that you consider everything. Um, another thing to consider um, when you're trying to develop a material, now this is more specific, um, there is always the issue in industry, especially we want to have, we want to produce a lot of products and want to sell a lot of products and sometimes availability is an issue. And if, especially if you're somewhere in the middle in the value chain where you're utilizing polymers, you're compounding them and then you're selling products, you're not making the polymers. So you cannot decide if these polymers are sourced sustainably, but what you can do is anticipate innovation. So if you see, for example, polyethylene, um, this could be produced by using bioethylene. And if it's not on the market yet, it can be anticipated that it will be there in five years. So you can already start developing in that direction, even though it is not available yet. So if you consider this, you will have a head start. And now my last point, I'm, I'm finished then. Uh, sustainability should be considered in any research topic, not just, uh, not, not just those labeled as such. I try to bring the sustainability aspects into all of my projects at Freudenberg. I did that during my PhD, even though it was not geared towards green chemistry or sustainability and is always a possibility because sustainability is a mindset. And with that, yeah, thank you very much. And sorry if I went over time. Emil, thank you so much for sharing a fascinating story and the take-home message is follow your passion and stand up for your passion and make an impact. Thank you. Now, I think we are ready to transition to our final panelist. Dr. Sanjaya Tsenanyake is a chemist at the Brookhaven National Laboratory. Sanjaya. Great, thank you, Jörg. Um, I'm very happy to be part of this panel and uh, you've heard some wonderful stories uh, up to date. Uh, I'm a little different from the others in the sense I work inside the U.S. Department of Energy complex. Uh, I'm a chemist at Brookhaven National Lab. This is one of the 17 national labs uh, that are run in the United States uh, to basically pursue energy solutions, both for the nation and largely for the planet. This uh, specific topic of sustainability 
uh, and understanding circularity and looking for better solutions is very dear to me. Uh, I have uh, seen this from many, many different sides. I'm, I'm an immigrant to the United States, having lived in many parts of the world. I came to the United States uh, basically to pursue a postdoctoral uh, research program here, um, part of Oak Ridge National Lab, and I basically stayed. This year was my 15th year anniversary at Brookhaven, uh, and I'm very passionate about the, the work that goes on here. Uh, we really focus on team science uh, at these national labs, so it's really not just about individual PIs, this determined my decision to stay uh, at a national lab because I was excited uh, to be part of big teams that have access to big uh, experimental facilities. Uh, and this has been uh, the cornerstone of a lot of the work that I've done in the last 15 years. I belong to a group uh, that basically looks at the foundational questions related to the activation of small molecules, uh, especially carbon dioxide, uh, methane, and hydrogen. And these are all about like uh, sustainable processes that can take uh, some of these greenhouse gas pollutants towards uh, more uh, more sustainable fuels. Um, in the last several years, uh, I've been very, very uh, privileged to also be recognized as an early career recipient from the previous Department of Energy. It set me on a pathway to, uh, to having an independent career. And I focused that uh, also on uh, looking for new feasible ways to convert methane into, 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 into chemical fuels. Uh, in terms of my career trajectory, last year, um, I got a chance to look inside the larger Department of Energy complex um, through an Oppenheimer Fellowship. That also opened my perspective about national priorities. Uh, here in the United States, uh, we have a strong focus on achieving net zero targets by 2050. And, and just within the year and a half or so, we've seen some incredibly important investments uh, that drive towards sustainable production of, uh, of chemicals capturing CO2 and trying to uh, achieve some meaningful uh, uh, technological innovations in this space. And as you've, you've already heard lots of this in terms of sustainability, uh, circularity, and net zero objectives from the other speakers. Now, in terms of uh, uh, Brookhaven's uh, uh, focus, um, we certainly uh, bring together a collection of chemists, physicists, uh, uh, biologists, and material scientists, and theorists to really bear on some of these mission-related uh, targets, and these mission-related targets uh, can be very different from year to year. Um, in the case of uh, uh, some of the more uh, uh, UN uh, sustainable goal developments, for me, clean energy, which is the number seven goal and highlighted this month, is one of the most important ones uh, because it ensures access to affordable, reliable, and sustainable modern energy processes. Uh, and in that regard, it fits perfectly within the U.S. Department of Energy's uh, critical mission. If you look closely at that goal, there is actually three sub-goals, uh, the first of which is access to that energy, because as innovation takes place or takes hold, very often these uh, exclude communities, uh, especially around the planet, uh, that do not necessarily have the technological innovations that are available to us. So we need this to be affordable and reliable. Uh, the second is really to increase the share of that renewable energy rather than have uh, hegemonies where you have geopolitics and other things that are focused around fossil fuels. We need to think more about the sustainability aspect of, uh, of how that uh, uh, share is, uh, is produced. And that's basically the second sub-goal. The third of which is just to basically improve uh, the efficiency uh, of that energy deliverable. So I'm very passionate about these three focuses. Um, and uh, over the next couple of years, I hope to really try to be more engaged in this aspect. Uh, I've been a member of the American Chemical Society for almost now, I think close to 20 years. And uh, it has always provided me with uh, lots of great incentives to, uh, to engage with other professionals, uh, both within the United States and across the world. Um, I feel very strongly about workforce development and especially many of you who are coming through the ranks, uh, I feel passionately about the use of intellectual driving forces, in particular mentorship and also uh, 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 sponsorship of, uh, of, of young scientists. It's, this is really a critical part and the emergence of workforce development needs uh, is absolutely essential to, 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 to achieve sustainable practices. So thank you and I'm happy to be part of the, uh, part of the conversation. Jörg, back to you. Thank you so much for sharing your fascinating story, Sanyaya. 
We are now at the point of our webinar where we engage in Q and A's. And again, thank you so much for sending your questions either through private chat or through the questionnaire, which was associated with the Zoom registration. So let me kick off uh, the Q and A session with a question first for Sanjaya and probably Adelina. Um, could you share with us all who helped you find your career purpose and how did they do that? So we are touching there on the subject of role models or mentors. Sanjaya, do you want to go first? Yes, sure. Thank you. So this is a very important uh, topic. I just briefly mentioned that uh, a few minutes ago, and um, I've been very privileged to have very good supervisors, uh, excellent mentors, and over the years, also some very, very important sponsors. Uh, these three uh, these three components are very different and they play different roles um, in my life and certainly have uh, uh, helped me create a path forward. All of them, including my uh, past PhD advisor and uh, and others, have all remained close friends, uh, and I rely on them on a regular basis to uh, to sort of guide me in terms of hard decisions at times uh, and perhaps even looking for greater purpose uh, or even sharing my ideas with them. Uh, this is largely uh, been not always the case for many others, and I appreciate that. Um, from my perspective, as somebody who also now in turn mentors and looks after uh, uh, younger students and postdocs, this relationship is sometimes can be the make or break uh, uh, component for everybody's futures. Uh, so it's important also to see yourself someday. Uh, many of you will lead institutions, many of you will hire and fire people and uh, teach them all the best practices of what your science brings to you. And in terms of the chemical uh, uh, sciences, uh, it's not just about providing uh, people with uh, the educational needs that they're looking for. It's also to look beyond that. Um, I think this is a very important uh, uh, role that we must all play at some stage in our careers. Thank you. Excellent. Adelina, what are your thoughts? Thanks so much, Jörg. Uh, you know, I, I think I, I had a couple of uh, wonderful mentors as well. I, I uh, also had that privilege. You know, one of the the key things that um, I've learned is, you know, to, to be able to, to use inspiration from what's been done, but then to look forward and see what needs to be done as well in the future. And I, I don't think I had a chance to, to highlight this in uh, in my seven minutes, but, um, you know, the, the field of green chemistry has evolved very significantly. And I've, I've had a chance to, to see that happen firsthand um, from my mentors. But, you know, we've got a, from a focus on, on the tools of green chemistry, which are the, the principles of green chemistry. And, and if you're looking for that information, um, it's available in, in the slides that I'm sharing um, after the talk to now more focus on sustainable chemistry, which is a little bit broader, right? And, and looks at how we can combine wonderful chemistry that's on the fundamental level, um, insightful and innovative, with the way that it's implemented uh, in the real world, which means that we also think about whether it's economically viable, whether it has uh, you know, the, the ability to, um, to be scaled. Uh, and I think uh, Emil and a couple of other of the panelists also touched on this big systems approach. Um, so I, I hope that that's, that's something that um, our um, audience here also starts to think about. Think about your research from the big picture view of how can it make an impact. Um, and, and that's likely to lead to, to more potentially impactful fundamental research questions. Excellent. Thank you so much, Adelina. The next question would be for Stephanie and for Emil. Um, could you share with us what role did professional societies such as the GDCH or the ACS play in your own career development? And what should our audience keep in mind as they shape their own career story, which what is in for them by engaging with ACS, GDCH, or any other Korean professional uh, professional society? Um, Stephanie, do you want to go first? Uh, yes, I can do that. Um, yeah, as you said in the introduction, I'm a board member of our um, section at uh, GDCH uh, on environmental chemistry and ecotoxicology. And together with the uh, CTEC, the Society of Environmental Toxicology and Chemistry, we do have a postgraduate program uh, where you can get a training in ecotoxicology. Um, 
I can really recommend this. I did the program myself in years ago and it was really nice to get to know other people that work in this field. And I mean, ecotoxicology world is quite small. So you, you get to meet them again and again during your career. And it's very nice for networking and also, of course, uh, get to know a little, a uh, lot about the different aspects of ecotoxicology. So um, for networking, uh, and this was a very important um, part of my, my career development. And I'll put a link in the jet, chat for the German um, participants. Uh, maybe they're interested in this as well. Super, thank you. Imo, what are your thoughts on this topic? Yeah, I, I outlined part of it in my uh, introductory uh, talk. Um, but I think there are, there are two main, main benefits when engaging in these types of uh, professional networks. As you could see, I was all around them. Uh, ACS, unfortunately not. <laughs> there was no room for that anymore, but uh, touched uh, with a lot of people from ACS or engaged also in ACS through the IYCN, the International Younger Chemist Network again. So yeah, it, it is all connected. Um, I think the one of the most important aspects in terms of career development is it is just a pool of engaged people, like-minded people um, that you can work together with to just push an idea that you have. Uh, like I said, I uh, I just wanted to have this sustainability platform and it was possible to make it and, uh, and push um, initiatives for this sustainability outreach through this network. I would have never been able to do that on my own just here in my regional bubble university. I needed to do that through such a professional network. And this is one of the benefits. If you're interested in doing that, putting in the work and the effort to drive these initiatives, that's a place to go. And the second aspect is I learned so much in terms of soft skills from these types of engagements. Um, working in a team, leading a team, leading projects. And as you can see from my uh, job description, I'm now a project manager. And um, when I was uh, when I was asked about my uh, engagement in these types of networks during the interview, um, of course, I could tell some tell them something about how I work on projects and how I acquire them and that I set smart goals and th these types of things that typically you are not taught in university. So through this engagement, I could also acquire skills that could circle back to my professional network that I just got along the way while trying to push for it forward my passion. Wonderful. Thank you. So the next question is actually from an audience member who just submitted it. It's about internships. Do you have any tips for grad students or postdocs that are looking for internships that help them develop skills, competencies, uh, motivations to make a big difference in the sustainability area. And I make a quick plug for ACS because uh, you might or might not know, ACS hosts the Get Experience um, website, which is managed by Justin Yu also on this call. Thank you, Justin. Uh, through that website, you will have opportunities to explore many different types of internships. Some of them might focus on, on sustainable, sustainability topics, but the majority probably on other areas. So any thoughts on internships, how to secure an internship? Stephanie. Um, yes, I would definitely recommend not to be hesitant to apply for an internship in a topic where you have never worked upon or have for a long time not worked upon. But um, I mean, internships are supposed to, to provide new information and, and learning. So um, I would definitely recommend to apply for an internship on environmental chemistry, even though you haven't focused on that topic in the master. So um, feel free. And um, of course, the German Environment Agency is also always open for internships. So if you're interested, you can also apply at us. Excellent. Wonderful. So. It is about five minutes before we have to wrap up this session. I would suggest that we might actually uh, ask Dr. Karin Ferber to talk a little bit about the next portion that follows this webinar. Karin, would you quickly explain a webinar quiz and the big additional challenge? Yes, very happy to do that. 
So it was a very fascinating conversation that I was able to attend here. Yeah, um, I will put into the chat a link to a quiz and the quiz will have one question per participant and you will be able to open the quiz right now. Just put that in for everyone. So there's the link. And it's not very tricky to answer these initial questions. And at the um, bottom of the page, and I open this right here, and I hope that it opens. And I hope that you have it open already. That's not open for me now, for whatever reason. Um, I go here. So that I can share that with you. Karin, I think I just opened it and I share it on the screen. I think that's a good idea. That is perfect. Because, yeah, excellent. So you see one question per participant and uh, the answers were mentioned in the talks. You also have the possibility you get the recording immediately after the session to listen again. But I think some decision moments were really very prominent in the conversation. And towards the end of the questions, you see the challenge. And the challenge is a more in-depth question to reinforce what the panelists have told you about. So their area of research um, that they worked in or are working in is touched by this. Um, yeah, you can, you can open that, that's fine. <laughs> um, is touched by this in-depth questions, it's PDF. And you will have seven days to answer these in-depth questions and to send your answers to me. And if you answered those in-depth questions, we will have um, a prize. And it's not one prize, it's a group of prizes. And let me just stand up so that I can show you two of those. So one is a t-shirt um, from the ACS. And the other one is the little early from the GDCH. And I hope that you see that too. And this comes together with uh, expert search support from CS. So please feel free to enter the challenge. It's not uh, unsolvable. It can be solved as it's written on the t-shirt. You have solutions for everything because you're a chemist. And uh, we look forward to receive your applications. And don't forget, you get um, search support, expert search support, and you get some very nice things that you cannot buy. Thank you. I really appreciate giving those details to our audience. And I will be up on, for that challenge immediately. But I, I uh, anyway, so um, I know there are many more questions and our time is limited. So you know who we are and feel free to reach out to me, to maybe other panelists, to other speakers via LinkedIn or email. We will share some contact information in the follow-up email later on, and we are happy to answer any questions you might have and that we couldn't answer right now. But at, we are at a point where we, where we would like to ask um, all four panelists for a last piece of advice, a final thought, a piece of career advice. And I would suggest we start in the reversed order, which we had earlier. So let's start with Sanyaya. Okay, um, final advice. I would say really be passionate and uh, feel uh, the the will of your, your education and your uh, interests to drive your career decisions and be aware of the planet's needs uh, and consider it a model imperative to address those. Um, and please reach out to any number of us. Uh, it is a very large community. Uh, we're international by many ways. And in that regard, uh, we are all very supportive. So please, uh, good luck and uh, look forward to hearing more from everybody. Thank you. Stephanie. Uh, yeah, my uh, advice would be uh, always try to see the bigger picture because, um, of course, it's important in many jobs and PhDs to dig deep and work on details. but I think it's important to, from time to time, to step up, take a step back and uh, think about why you're doing what you're doing and what consequences this might have, because um, effects of chemicals in the environment is not something that only environmental chemists uh, should think about and worry about, but everyone dealing with the design and use of chemicals or products made of them. And I think Emil is a perfect example on how it should be. I think you mentioned Emil. Let's go to Emil. Emil. <laughs> 
Yes, I mean, I can second what the others said, follow your passion and, and, and all of that. Um, and I think it is it is indeed the most important aspect of it all. And when you're doing that and you're raising awareness and doing all of these things, do not forget to act because as you're a scientist and you're doing research, it is not only about raising awareness because if everyone only raises awareness and no one acts, then we did not win anything. So do not forget to act as well upon these things. And it will be thanked um, in your job interview when you can use these types of engagements, be it professional or be it uh, volunteer work um, as case examples. When you're asked questions, you can draw from that and then explain your passion uh, with this example. And this makes a much better impression than just to list some skills in the job interview. Thank you so much. And Adelina? Well, all the good ones were taken, but I'll, <laughs> I'll give you mine. You know, be really proactive. All the good things I think that, that have happened in my career were because I, I did things that were not immediately required in the job I was in at the moment. So volunteer in your uh, local section or your, your chemical society. Um, spend a, you know at least a few minutes each day looking for other ways that you can connect what you're currently doing to other bigger challenges. And I think you'll find that there's lots of need for uh, your scientific expertise in helping address these bigger problems. Wonderful. And I see, Karin, your hand is up. Yeah, one little comment. It's also not too bad to collect certificates that prove that you take care for <laughs> green and sustainable chemistry. And in the end, if you pass the test and enter the challenge, you get a certificate. Of course, you need to succeed, but you have all that you need to do that because you joined the session. So welcome again in the competition. Excellent. And a big thank you to every single panelist, to the planning committee, to the support team. And most importantly, it is clear that GDCH, ACS, and CES, we care. We care about the planet's, planet's destiny, and we care about the next generation of professionals that can make a true difference. Thank you so much for joining today's session, and we hope to see you in person or maybe on another Zoom call. Take care. Talk to you soon. Bye-bye.